Hey, this is Jonathan with Limitless Mindset. And today I am chatting with JT. How you doing today, man? Yeah, I'm uh, I'm good, man. It, it's a little bit cloudy down here in Florida. It's been sunshine and gorgeous the last couple of days. So, you know, you take the good and uh, you take the bad. So, but uh, I'm doing well. Yeah, well, you have good complexion. You look like you're getting the sun and the vitamin D that you need. Yeah, I. Uh, it's part of... Uh, I uh, part of the reason why I moved to Florida a couple of years ago was um, in my diagnosis with cancer, you know, part of part of actually healing for me is the mental part. Sorry about this quick interruption. I've got an important call to action for you. Please go watch this video and subscribe to Limitless Mindset over on one of the alt tech platforms, Rumble or Odyssey. And that is where you can catch my latest videos along with browsing my entire library of content and videos and podcasts. Over 700 pieces of edifying content about biohacking, nootropics, smart drugs, anti aging, life hacking, about my pragmatic, full spectrum, anti-fragility philosophy. If you value health freedom, I urge you to get outside of your digital comfort zone just a little and vote for the kind of future you want with your attention. Join and use the pro free speech social media platforms. I have the links below this video to where you can connect with me on those platforms. I do pay more attention to the comments that I get on those. Please don't procrastinate any further in taking back your freedom and your privacy from big tech. Don't even pause this video. Just pick one of the alt tech platforms. I think that Odyssey is the best. It's kind it's a lot like YouTube. It's as good as YouTube as a video platform, but there's no annoying ads interrupting the videos. So just pick one of those. Again, I've got them linked below and join it in another tab or window while we get back to what you clicked on. And so I was living up in the Boston area and it's cold and it's gray, you know, six months out of the year. And so to be able to be in Florida, wake up in most days, see sunshine and be able to get out and, and enjoy myself. It's uh, it's more mental therapy and it helps with the physical as well. Great. Yeah. We can get into all that, all that kind of environmental stuff and how it affects us uh, so much. I wanted to give a quick rundown on you. So you have a an oddly named uh, podcast yourself called Cancer and Chill, which I listened to some episodes of. And you have a, what sounds like kind of a harrow harrowing life experience of battling cancer for six and a half years now. And you have a, a rare form of a soft tissue sarcoma. And you're one of these people that falls into a minority with what's I suppose considered a an incurable form of cancer, kind of a, a rare form of cancer, right? Yeah. Uh so you're 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 right on. I uh I was diagnosed uh six and a half years ago, October 2013, uh, with a rare form of of sarcoma or tissue cancer. Sarcoma can be either tissue or bone or both. And diagnosed with uh we found an eight-pound tumor in my right calf muscle. And when when I say it's rare, um sarcoma in and of itself is not rare. 
but the specific type of uh, sarcoma that I have, it's called myxoid, M-Y-X-O-I-D, uh, liposarcoma. And it is, it's rare. Um, it, is, it, it is not treatable, so it is deemed as terminal. Um, but even in six and a half years since I've been diagnosed, the, you know, the medical community has found new ways of treating it, but there's no cure. Um, but, uh, you know, the goal at this point is to just try to continue to push it forward every couple, you know, 60, 90 days and in hoping that we will find some type of a treatment that, uh, will actually cure it. Yeah. You're in a race against time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, th that's what it is. And, um, you know, that, that may pause or may, that, may, that can cause at times some uneasiness. But in dealing with, with this disease for six and a half years, and when I say dealing with it, uh, I've been in constant treatment. Like, I just finished treatment a week. It, uh, this Tuesday will be a week. A, a week. I just finished some treatment uh, a week ago. So it would have been last Tuesday, not this last Tuesday, the Tuesday before. And so I've had uh, uh, two weeks because this Tuesday I'll go back in for scans. And chances are, you know, there's usually, once I have scans, there's usually chances I'll be back in treatment, some type of treatment within the next couple of weeks over the course of six and a half years. Add some breaks, but when I talk about a break is what I mean is we're just skipping, you know, four weeks or six weeks just to give my body uh, the ability to heal. And you're getting treated at the Mayo Clinic. What, what treatments have you undergone? So uh, I've been here at the Mayo just over three years, and I relocated from Dana-Farber Cancer Center, which is a different type of a place. I mean, they're both, they're both great. I've been at five cancer centers now. I've never left a cancer center uh, because I wasn't happy or because they weren't doing a good job. It was just my, my treatment had to progress. And it, it's really assuring when somebody looks at you. It, it's unnerving, but assuring when somebody looks at you and says, look, we've done everything we can for you, but we think you should probably think about one of these facilities. And so Dana-Farber is a cancer center. It is one of a handful of hospitals or cancer centers that specifically have a sarcoma specialty. And while I was at, at Dana-Farber, we had exhausted conventional chemotherapies at that moment. And my oncology team said, we think you probably need to think about moving into a clinical trial. And there's a clinical trial that we think may help you. And it was offered at Dana-Farber. It was offered at Dana-Farber in Boston. It was offered here in Jackson the Mayo Clinic, MD Anderson in Houston, Kettering up in New York City. Those are like the big four. And, and there are others, and that's not to, to downgrade cancer centers in general, but those are, are, are four, four places that at, at that time would really be able to help me in, in what I was going through. And so my oncology team in Boston said, we think you should think about this clinical trial. And I could have stayed at Dana-Farber. But the dilemma was in this clinical trial, as you probably know, when you enter a clinical trial, um, you don't know what you're going to expect. Like, I mean, well, I've referred to it as, hey, you're, you know, you're a pin cushion. They're testing things. It's a little bit more, um, it's a little bit more than that, but you, they don't know how your body's going to react. They don't know how you're going to feel. They don't know what your energy is going to be. And so I wanted to make sure I put myself in the best position to fight. And out of the four, um, it, it became Mayo, Mayo Clinic here in Jacksonville. And for a couple of reasons, I have a lifelong friend who was here. I'm a single guy. And, uh, and from a, a financial standpoint, I, I felt like there was a good indicator that sooner or later, I was going to have to step away from my work. And so I was going to have to rely on personal finance, disability, Medicare, those types for a season of my life. And from a financial picture, it just made more sense to uh, move down here to Jacksonville. So since being in Jacksonville, I had a clinical trial. Uh, I've had two rounds do, of chemotherapy. Do you, feel, do you feel like the 
clinical trial helped? Uh, I think the clinical trial, looking back at it, uh, I think the clinical trial moved me from the point I was at in Boston where we had, we had exhausted all chemotherapies. And, and I got here to, to do the trial. I did the trial, and that gave me about six to 10 months of time. And then the clinical trial did not work for me. So I think the clinical trial bought me some time. Uh, I do believe that there was a bit of a downside to the clinical trial in the way it made me feel. And, and I'm, I'm very open and honest about this. I mean, listen, cancer isn't fun. Chemotherapies, radiations, surgery, clinical trial, there is a downside to all of them. I, I never... Uh, and if you've heard my 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 podcast, Cancer Chill, it's really designed to help individuals uh, think through what that obstacle is in front of them. I don't give medical advice. I tell people all the time, not a doctor and not your doctor. I'm responsible for my. Answering your question, uh, I would say that there was an upside in that it bought me some time in a time where where many doctors were telling me we didn't have a lot of time and it gave us eight months to where we tried something. It did slow down the progression of my disease short term and then my disease progressed, but it progressed under, uh, under what it was naturally progressing. And then during that time, Jonathan, is when we found a chemotherapy that is, was used to try to slow the disease down and we started to implement radiation, a different type of radiation than I had had in the past. And what, what it allowed me to do is it allowed me to get into a radiation regimen to where we were seeing fantastic results with the radiation. Like, and, and, and again, there's a downside to radiation. I'm not going to say there isn't. Like there, you have to look, I think for me, you have to look at, at many factors when you're choosing, if you're going to do treatment, how you're going to do it, when you're going to do it, what are the effects? And that's all based on what's available to you. So the, it, the clinical trial bought me time, got me to, radi uh, got me to chemotherapy. Chemother the two rounds of chemotherapy here were the toughest I've ever, well, they weren't the toughest, but they were really tough. Um, and that chemotherapy is still available to me, but we use it We'll only use it when we have to, because there's a huge downside to that chemotherapy. And the truth is, I don't have, it's not like we have a lot of uh, tools in the arsenal for slowing the disease down. But what we learned was, uh, during this time, as, we, as, as progression happened and we had multiple tumors, we started to treat them uh, at Mayo Clinic under a certain type of radio regimen. And it was like, I mean, it was like back in the day when I, I'm a 51-year-old guy, you know, I started with video games playing asteroids. And I mean, you'd shoot it and boom, it's gone. And so we, we had great results because of, a re, uh, because of that, because of going into the trial. It made us look at other things and how to do that. And, and we also incorporate, also during that time, started to incorporate other things uh, into my regimen, it, not just medical, right? Because... Medical intervention is only one part of it, but we started to, we started to look at uh, diet and exercise and acupuncture and massage and, and, and treating the person as a whole uh, really began as a result of that clinical trial, which caused me to take a step back from work and really focus on everything in order to continue to push this thing you know, another 60 or 90 days. Okay. So I, I do want to get into some of the biohacking kind of stuff okay. that you've done, but I wanted to go back to 2013 and I wanted you to tell us what it was like to get diagnosed. And then what are the, the mindset kind of things that are crucial to as you say, dealing with the enormity of your diagnosis. Yeah, I mean, 
so let, let me just let me just say I'm I'm living in Scottsdale, Arizona at the time, and uh, I find we find a large what appears to, it it appears that my right leg. Uh, is overtrained. Like my right calf muscle is larger than my left. And so I'm a kid from the Midwest. I'm a Chicago kid. I've always been a big guy. We have big calves. And so I didn't really think anything of it. Right. And then over a course of a couple of months, people started pointing it out. And then uh, I was in Chicago uh, visiting my parents one day. And my mom and my sister-in-law had had noted there was something there. And I, I had just recently changed jobs, so I hadn't established a doctor uh, in Scottsdale. So I got back to Scottsdale, and uh, uh, prior to getting back from, from, from uh, Chicago, I had decided I was going to run on a treadmill. I was on a business trip, and I didn't have time to go to the gym. And I hate running. Like, I have no desire to run with. If you watch me, if you see me running, something's wrong. Because I'm like, I mean, going to help somebody or running from something. That's just, I'm not a runner. And so, but I needed some exercise. So I ran on a treadmill. And, and, and the day before I saw my mom and my sister-in-law is when I ran. I ran maybe 20, 30 minutes and run, walk. And what had happened was this calf muscle that had appeared to just be larger, it ballooned. I mean, it, it was three times the size of my left. And so it caused some concern, got back to Scottsdale, established a doctor and, uh, you know, went through the physical and did it, did it, did it. And I almost forgot to tell the doctor why I was there. You know what I mean? You go to the doctor and you're a brand new doctor. They're asking you this and setting this test up. I said, Oh, I forgot. I need you to take a look at, at, at my leg and my left pant leg up. And, and the doctor looked and she said, wow, you have a large calf. I was like, well, that's not the one that's got the issue. And I pulled the other one up and she was like, I mean, her, I could see her jaw drop. She was like, yeah, we got a problem. A and so she went out of the room. Yeah, I mean, the reaction was like crazy. So she went out of the room, brought another doctor. So this started a bunch of tests. So fast forward from this moment to about three or four months down the road. And I get a call uh, from my, my doctor you to go see this orthopedic oncologist. And honest here, when I tell you this, I didn't connect oncology and cancer because what the doctor told me was this was the best surgeon, orthopedic surgeon in Scottsdale. And so I just assume I pulled a muscle or a tendon. Cancer had never been discussed. It just, and I'm, I'm a businessman. I'm all I'm doing is trying to, you know, help build a business. And so I end up at an orthopedic oncologist's office on a Thursday morning at nine o'clock for an appointment. And I'm sitting in the room uh, and all of a sudden doctor comes in and he introduces himself. I've talked to him on the phone, but I've never met the man. And he introduces himself and he introduces another doctor and another doctor and, and then a staff psychologist. And I'm like, all I'm thinking to myself is, come on, man, I got stuff to do. Like, I, I'm not being rude, but I'm like, I got, you know, this is taking a lot of time. And so he sits down and, and he starts to talk some pleasantries with me. And I'm thinking, hey, man, I got stuff to do. And then he, he sits, uh, sits, so he looks directly at me and he says, so we did this test and we ruled this out. We did this test and we ruled this out and this test and we ruled this out. And I, I'm thinking, I got stuff to do. And he says, unfortunately, what I think we found here is a large mass. Mass? That's what he says. He uses the word mass. And I said, out loud, I'm like, mass? He's like, yeah, a large mass. And I said, you mean tumor? And he looked at me and he said, yes, unfortunately, I think we found a large tumor. And I looked at him and I said, doc, we don't know each other. I'm not afraid to die. Just shoot me straight. And that was my response. And I tell this to people often that we all want to believe that if we're driving down the street and we see a, uh, a building that we're going to stop our car, run inside and save everybody. We do. And, and that's noble. 
but but we never ever know what what we are going to do until we see that building on fire and and i really believe that's how we deal with these type of situations from a from an emotional or a cognitive standpoint so i i said i said that he looked at me and he repeated the words he says well this l- large mass and i looked at him i said ah 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 he said well i think this tumor is infected and i'm like infected and i said you mean cancer and he looked at me tears in his eyes and he said unfortunately i think it's late stage cancer and we don't have a cure and and so that was my introduction to cancer that was it and i i remember looking now at him I'm, and saying I'm go curious. ahead why would he jump to the assumption that there's no cure and that it's late stage? Because of, of, of how they had diagnosed it and through the process, they had needle biopsied it. Again, when, when, when they're going through multiple tests, they're over and over. You're like looking at things, but you're not paying attention to it. They didn't specifically, uh, specifically go in and needle biopsy. They were able to take a piece of tissue that they pulled out, and mm-hmm. that's, how they, that's how they believed that what, what they were dealing with. And they identified it as the myxoid sarcoma. Well, to, to be very honest with you, they misdiagnosed it first. They diagnosed it first as what they call spindle cell sarcoma, and later, about a year or so ago, a year after that, we realized that it wasn't spindle cell, that it was myxoid. And the truth of the matter is, is they look very similar. It wouldn't have changed the treatment objectives, but, but spindle, actually myxoid is actually would have been, myxoid is actually worse than what spindle cell would have been for me. Mm-hmm. Okay. And I'm curious if you have any, if you have any ideas of, of causality here, of, of why you got cancer. Well, I mean, you know, it's funny, like I said, as you, as you have been through, as somebody goes through something, they get more perspective or a different perspective. Um, it is, there are many theories on this. There are a lot of people who feel or would teach that uh, it, it becomes, it, it starts as a result of an injury, like a blunt injury. Yep. And yep. That's, what, uh, that's what Mark said, who I also interviewed on this topic. Yeah, and and then there are some that that would say that it's uh, just a genetic deficiency that uh, that my body has, and over time it just my body's been able to fight it, and then all of a sudden it's not. Um, I don't believe you know. There's a lot of people who would tell you, and and it's funny when when I became vocal about my cancer, um, I did it out of necessity for myself, because when I was diagnosed with cancer, I had never met anybody who had ever had cancer. I knew nobody. I, 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 so for me, I became uh, open and vulnerable, uh, vulnerable about it, because what I wanted to do was to find out, all right, what am I going to experience? Uh, as I've been through this for six and a half years, you know, you get a lot of people who will say, hey, well, try this or do this, or I need, you know, you should do this. And there's a lot of people who have absolute ideas on how to cure cancer. And it's very interesting to me that, you know, I'll, I'll have somebody call me and tell me, all right, here's what I need you to do. I need you to take, you know, uh, eight Advil, drink this broccoli mixture. Don't do this, do this, do this, and, and your cancer will be cured. There are th- thousands of people out there who will tell you what you should do to cure your cancer. But the truth is a lot of those, there's no, there's no real basis for that. And listen, and, and, and I, 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 this, uh, I have a phenomenal medical team, but the truth of the matter is they're guessing. They're guessing. Now they've gone to school. They've seen a lot. I would call it an educated guess and but at the end of the day it's it's my decision on what it is i need to do but you know somebody you know there's a lot of people who say well it, but when you really look into it 
you realize that that uh, that food does not have a 100% reason based or would not have a cure rate based on 100%. I think if you eat a smarter diet, you'll put yourself into a better position to fight. But I don't think there's one way to cure any, at least my specific type of cancer. Yeah, sure. Sometimes you're just the victim of the entropy of molecules colliding in your own body. And sometimes something really unfortunate happens and then you have to deal with it. Right. I mean, it's, you know, I hate to say it, I hate to boil it down to it, uh, to this, but sometimes it's, it's a, a bad luck of the draw. And, you know, you know, I guess early on that would bother me, but the 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 more i'm engaged and the longer i battle this the more i can disassociate from the the emotional side of that because to be very honest with you um i don't spending any time thinking about why it happened at this point in the game is wasted time and energy i need my time and energy uh focused on how do i get through the next you know 3 weeks and also, how do I, how do I pass this information on? That's why I started a podcast because, uh, you know, I I spent the last six years telling people about my disease on Facebook, and I realized that long after we're both gone, you know, Facebook is going to be irrelevant. And so, if I can audio out there that can help somebody where they're at in their diagnosis. That's really where I want to spend my energy. Yeah, I hope that we can immortalize your message in MP3 format for for all the people in the future that are going to that are going to deal with this. the The specter of cancer is it really is enormous. I in in Mark's book, he was talking about how the AMA is estimating that in the future it's going to be. And this is incredibly pessimistic, but they're estimating that in the future, something like half of Americans are going to be diagnosed with with cancer, apparently based upon the current trends. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I, I often say this when I'm talking to somebody, if I'm in a restaurant, and I'll say, hey, look around, there's 100 people in here. And you know, 40% of them have cancer and 30% of them don't even know it. And, and that's, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm 51 years old and I was diagnosed at 45 and, you know, life was pretty good. You know what I mean? I, you never, ever wake up and think, all right, today, somebody's going to tell me something and it has the possibility of changing my life forever. And so I don't think you want to walk through life being fearful of things. Um, because it'll put you in a bad position to where uh, when, you're, when you encounter something, you'll have a hard time fighting. I think for me, to be very honest, the, the reason why I've done so well with this disease is because since I was a little boy, uh, my parents never fixed problems for me. Like my dad, my dad's an immigrant from Ireland and you know, he had 12 brothers and sisters. They lived on a farm. I'm not thinking that his mom and dad had a lot of time to fix his problems. So when I was four years old and I had a four year old problem, my parents were like, all right, here's your problem. Fix it this way, this way, or figure it out. And then as a four year old, I learned to navigate that. And then as a six year old and a 10 year old and an 18 year old and a 20 year old, they didn't fix my problems. And so that was, that was paramount for me because when I was diagnosed with cancer, I, I, and I hate to say it because I don't want to minimize it. I just looked at it like, all right, this is another problem. This is another turn of the Rubik's Cube. I got to figure out how to navigate this. And so my mind went into a way of, all right, how do I stay in front of this? And that's why uh, I've learned that at the end of the day, when it comes to this disease and my diagnosis, I have fantastic doctors. And, and I'm very blessed in that. I can call any one of the doctors in my past, like from Dana-Farber or in Scottsdale or wherever I was at, and I can say, hey, 
here's what I'm up against. Here's what we're thinking. What's your perspective? And then I can take all of that information into understanding. And, and I have to be honest with you, there's times where I've refused treatment. I'm like, yeah, I don't, I don't think that that, now that isn't me being smarter than my medical team, but it's me taking everybody's understanding, understanding my body, where my disease has been, where we're at now to go. So it's an approach of looking at myself from all angles and then making the best educated decision. Now, what I'm curious about here is all of this treatment sounds astronomically expensive. How have you afforded this? Because you've kind of put your career on hold for yeah. like the better yeah, part mean, of a decade. Yeah, it's, um, it's ridiculous. I'm actually, um, today or yesterday, I started to record my next podcast, which isn't out until April 9th. And it's titled Navigating the Financial Side of Cancer. And so, you know, with a dad who was an immigrant from Ireland and, and my mom and my brother, uh, my dad taught me, gave me the greatest gift of teaching me not to spend it if you don't have it. And so I started to do that at a young age. And, you know, my dad's a, an Irishman, so uh, he, he has his communion money still. And my dad's almost 80 this year. Oh, and, wow. And listen, that doesn't mean we didn't, we didn't have what we needed. What it meant was we didn't need to get stuff just to get it. Like my dad, like they never had a house payment. And, and my dad was, my dad worked for people's gas. It's not like he made a huge amount of money. It's just, they saved, he paid cash for everything. And so I was taught that lesson as well. And so I, nobody's prepared to battle cancer from a financial standpoint at 45, but uh, and, and I was working on this podcast today, the, 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 the financial conversation of cancer has to be done as quickly as the diagnosis is discovered. Because if you don't get in front of that, you will be financially ruined. And, and to, let me explain to you. I mean, I, it's so weird because I just, I just listed the three things that happened to me early on. I had a test that I needed to have. Um, to test to test the tumor against therapies that were available because my cancer was deemed progressive. And so we had decided to do this uh, certain type of test, but this test was so new that insurance did not recognize it and the cost was $25,000. And $25, I didn't earn that until months after we did the test. Okay, so I get a $25,000 bill from a cancer center or research center in Dallas Wow. And I call them and they're like, we're sorry. Now, I worked with them on getting that to a reasonable amount, but I still had to come out of pocket. I think it was $7,500. Like, nobody's prepared for that. I heard uh, when, my, when, when my cancer had metastasized into my sinus cavity and the surgery was not covered. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know that until months after. And so I tell people all the time, and in and, and that podcast, I, I'll, I'll record later this week uh, uh, on financial. I tell them that that conversation has to be had up front. And you've got to find a financial navigator to help you through it. And there, you know, six and a half years ago, there weren't a lot of financial navigators. This was just a new area. But you've got to put yourself in the situation of somebody who understands what you may be encountering from a financial standpoint. Paper, I, I do it every year. I look at what I get from disability, which is not a lot, and I supplement for my living expenses. And so there's a way to navigate this financially because you have to stay current with a cancer center or they're not going to treat you. You know, a couple of the, the, work, you know, the, the toughest calls are when your cancer uh, center calls you and says, hey, um, uh, you cannot have this treatment unless you pay for it up front. That's happened to me several times. And, and then the other call as you get is, you know, from the financial office that tells you you haven't made a payment on your bill and it's going to go to collections. And so there's a way to navigate that. Like I have thousands and thousands of dollars that I owe other cancer centers. But to be honest with you, I, I pay those as I can and they're understanding. 
because what I have to do is I have to stay current with Mayo Clinic or my treatment's going to stop. So yeah, you got to prioritize. Yeah. And, and so it never, listen, it never works out on paper. Like it just never does. At the beginning of the year, I look at my budget and just my insurance alone. I think my insurance alone right now is because I've just moved to Medicare. My insurance alone is $1,200 a month. And I get just, I think I get $2,800 a month from disability. I mean, that's just, that's just my health insurance. And so you're always trying to navigate it. So, um, you know, I'm, again, growing up the way I grew up, my parents also taught me, uh, always pay your bills. And so going to stiff somebody who's trying to help save my life, but the cancer community is understandable. There are grants. People are like, so you see the best in people like in, in today's day and age where we're dealing with this uh, COVID-19, you see either the best or the worst in people. And, but my has been, I, I have friends who every once in a while will help. I've had a couple of benefits, but at the end of the year, it always works out. It's like, I'm either uh, a few thousand dollars behind or I'm current or I'm, I'm close and I'm staying in treatment. And, you know, there's also benefit in a cancer center, uh, helping you stay in treatment, somebody like myself, because I'm a different breed of a cancer patient in, in my disease. Um, I mean, I, I've met, I've had 10 friends, they've become friends since my diagnosis. I, I, I've watched 10 friends pass in the last two years from the same disease that I have, and they got wow, it after me. So, so it's, I think it's good. It's good for the Mayo Clinic to have somebody like myself because it allows them to kind of study the progression. That doesn't mean they're going to say, hey, we're not charging you. That, it's a business. A hospital is a business. I tell that to people all the time. You have to understand the Mayo Clinic for me, this is the best get today, but it's still a business. They still got to pay their bills and they are expecting me to do my part. And what I also wanted to ask you about, I imagine, what, well, I actually don't have to imagine this because my little brother, he had cancer actually when he was very young. He was about 17 years old and he developed osteosarcoma in his knee. And then he struggled with cancer for about five years and he ultimately lost his leg as a result. And so I know what a huge impact it has on the family. When, when people contact you, and I imagine a lot of people find you and then they contact you when they're first diagnosed, what sort of tips do you give people that are dealing with, there's probably a sense to this where you feel like, okay, okay, I can get through this. I can deal with this myself, but breaking the news to my family and dragging my family along this journey with me, what kind of tips do you give people for that? Well, I, when somebody contacts me and it happens multiple times a day, and it's not necessarily just the uh, first time, like I have people who will contact me for six months and then they go away for a year and then they come back because something's changed or, or, or whatever. But whenever anybody contacts me, I, most of the time, uh, 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 almost a hundred percent of the time, I would say that I've experienced what they're going through, but I, I don't tell them that. So what I do is I just listen to them and I try to find out where they're at. And then I try to assess, okay, what is the speed bump? What are they needing? Like, is, is it an uh, anxiety issue? Is it is it, I mean, I, I, had a, I had a buddy call me, I, I did this podcast a couple of weeks ago, was how do you tell your family you have a terminal diagnosis? And, and it happened for me. And, and I also remember being called out of a meeting uh, when I uh, was, at, was working for iHeart. And I, I, somebody called me and said, hey, uh, do you got a minute? And I said, yeah. And he said, hey, I just walked out of my oncologist's office and my oncologist, who I just met, uh, told me I have terminal cancer and I don't know how to tell my wife. And so 
what I try to do when somebody calls me, I just really just try to listen. And then I'll ask questions to try to get to, okay, what, what's going on here? Is it a fear of the unknown? Is it uh, they really want to get a second opinion? Is, what is it? And then what I try to do is I just try to guide them to where they need to go, where they need to make their decision. I try not to tell people, hey, you need to do this. I would rather say, well, think about this because I'm a preventative maintenance guy. Like I look down the road. I mean, I'll, I'll have scans on Tuesday. We'll get results. We'll get results Tuesday because, but because the hospital's in such a weird transition right now, one of my oncologists, I cannot talk to them till Thursday. But before I walk out of, before I walk out of the Mayo on Tuesday, I'll have already spoken with my medical oncologist. But I already have an idea. If we're going into treatment, we're doing two things. The guy, I know we're either going back to a chemotherapy or we're going to go ahead and, and look at some radiation for some tumors that I have that we weren't able to get this last time. So I've already put myself mentally in that position. The chemotherapy is tougher than the radiation. Radiation is harder on my body, but this type of chemotherapy just beats me up for some reason. But I've also had a lot of radiation. So, so in saying that, I've already mentally prepared and, and I've already physically made adjustments for either. Like I changed my diet certain ways. I, I intermittent fast. I watch certain types of foods because what I want to do is put myself in the best position. So I'm a preventive maintenance guy. So what I try to do is with somebody when they call me and they say, okay, here's the situation. I've already listened to what they said and I'm trying to get them to think forward. Like if somebody calls me and says, okay, Diagnosed with cancer, they want to do chemo and radiation. I always say to them, okay, a couple of things you want to do or you want to think about doing, because I never tell them what to do. Um, you want to dial back your lifestyle, right? You want to, why I tell people, become selfish. Think about yourself because everybody and their brother is going to want to come over and take you bowling. But no, what you need to do is rest because there's going to come a day where you're going to fight with yourself because you can't even get off the couch to go to the bathroom and you want to save your energy. If you're having chemo and radiation, immediately you want to try to put some weight on if, if you're underweight, right? Because weight, for me, weight equals strength. So whatever the situation they're encountering, if it's a mental situation, if it's a stress situation, it's an anxiety, if it's a death issue, what they think they're going to die. You know, I'll, I tell this to everybody who calls me. If they're newly diagnosed, they'll say, all right, I got this diagnosis, da da da, da. So slow down. Before you get into treatment, that diagnosis is going to change and the treatment's going to change. And I'm not wrong about that. Like, again, I don't, I don't try to, hey, look, I know everything. But from dealing with cancer on my level and with hundreds of people, I, I can't think of one where the day it was diagnosed, the, diagnose, the diagnosis stayed the same and the treatment protocol stayed the same. Usually there's some tweaking. So, I always tell people, you know, let's, let's, let's not, you know, let's not panic till it's time to panic, right? Because in that moment where you're diagnosed with cancer, there's two things that most people think when somebody tells them they have cancer, they think I'm going to die and get it out. And, and that causes this, this overwhelming desire to panic and just start doing stuff. And, and it's that burning building moment. How are they going to do with it? So what I try to do is I try to kind of put my arms around them and say, okay, well, cancer's not fun. It's bad. Like I, I'm not one of these guys who, you know, hey, look at me. I, you know, I beat this. I've not beat this disease. This, you know, I mean, I get ahead and then it knocks me back. And then I get ahead a little bit and it knocks me back. But I'm always looking forward to say, all right, how can I get my quality of life just a little bit better? And how can we push this forward? So that's what I'm trying to do with those do you who have call hope? To figure out where do you they're have at. Hope that, that you'll beat it eventually? Um, you know, I used to I used to tell myself and tell others, I used to say there's a better chance cancer is going to take me than old age. I used to say that. And I think that was part to give myself an okay that this disease might take my life. Like, uh, you know, you have to, it's different stages of thinking. I don't think you can think yourself into being cured. 
I, I don't believe that. Like I did a podcast on does positivity really matter? And the answer is yes and no. Like, no, I don't believe just being positive is going to cure my cancer. Does positivity help me every single day to get to the next step? Absolutely. But I'm, I, 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 to answer that question, so, so I used to say that. Now I've started to say uh, I might die with cancer, but not because of it. And I think there's another transition in that thinking, but it's not as easy as just starting to say stuff. You got to believe it. Like, I think there's another trans, uh, uh, transition, and that transition is I am going to beat this. But let me tell you this. I have a hat here which, which says, uh, hashtag, I believe in miracles. And here's what I've learned oh, about okay. cancer. Uh, here's what I've learned is that miracle isn't in the cure only. The miracle already has been experienced by me because I'm able to live life with cancer. That's a true miracle. Like that's a big miracle because like I said, a lot of people when they're diagnosed with cancer, they go into a they go into a, a you know, a fetal position. And and I, I encounter that a lot and I try to get people out of that because once you disassociate from a mental and emotional standpoint, you have problems. You have true problems. So I can't, you know, I I would love to say to you, I would love to say, hey, "Jonathan, yeah, I'm going to beat this." I can't because cancer's complex. I pray every single day. I do everything I possibly can. I'm totally involved in my cancer care. Like I run my cancer care like I used to run radio stations, hire the best people in their area, teach them, engage them. But at the end of the day, I'm still responsible for the radio station. So I still have to be the decision maker. And that's how I run my cancer care. I have fantastic doctors, but I don't allow them just to make random decisions what I'm going to do. I don't do it. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I ask them questions. I push them. I sometimes create conflict in the room. I say, well, what about this? What about that? And my medical team has started, has taken my lead. And when, when, when I have an oncologist look at me and say, well, what if we try this? What if, you know, maybe let me, call this doc and get his stuff. Maybe we do cryotherapy now, or maybe we do some type of a, a thermal imaging, or maybe we do this, or, or maybe diet, maybe diet will help us with this, or acupuncture, or massage. That's when you know you have a team working towards a direction. Hmm. Okay. So I had, did you listen to that podcast interview that I did with Mark? Yeah, yeah, I did. Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah. So his, the, his whole sentiment, and he wrote a couple of books about this, yep. was, that the, was that the mainstream paradigm, the hack, slash, and burn treatments, what he documented in his books is that these are so often iatro iatrogenic, so to speak. And well, first of all, I First of all, I, I just urge people, I urge everyone out there who doesn't have cancer, I, I urge them to really give a damn about their health. And I urge them to, you know, instead of buying that new uh, television or Xbox, I urge them to invest in their health every single way that they can. And that's really what I'm about personally. Uh, that's, you know, every single day, uh, twice a day, actually, me and my wife use one of these, uh, one of these near infrared therapy devices for about 15 minutes that have pretty good evidence as far as a, as far as like cancer prevention. Well, I, I'm very, very clean living. I use all the different kinds of supplements that seem to prevent cancer. So, so first of all, I just, I urge everyone out there that it's the, yeah, the, the AMA says that the AMA seems to believe that we all, at least in America, have at least a, a, a coins flip chance of acquiring cancer and all of the, all of these different environmental factors out there that seem to aggravate cancer. Things like the the toxins, the toxins in the foods, the toxins in the vaccines, the 5G radiation, 
there's no there's no there's no sign of of our world becoming becoming less toxic and so while you know while everybody is like the world hysteria right now is on the coronavirus whereas the the chances of an average person being killed by the coronavirus or even having a bad time with it are so low whereas it seems like the can the, the the chances of a of a cancer diagnosis are are so high and so I imagine just for myself, this is, this is just my view, and I'd love to hear yours, for myself, based upon what I learned in, in Mark's books, I, I feel like the, the whole industry surrounding cancer, I feel like this industry is just a, it's just a symptom of this general kind of um, tyrannical, predatory capitalism that is metastasizing across the earth. And my, my whole life, I have had such a disdain and a, and a hatred for any sort of tyranny or uh, authoritarian force that I felt was out there in the world trying to impose itself on me, that I think if, if I ever received a cancer diagnosis, I would just... I, I don't think I would receive any sort of mainstream treatment. I think I would probably continue to do everything, all of the healthy living type things that I would do that I do now. And I think I would, I would probably do a bit more praying <laughs> than I do than I do currently, to be frank. But I think that if I ever received a cancer diagnosis, and I think probably a lot of a lot of people feel this way. You know, a lot of people have kind of a an anti-establishmentarian sort of slant to them, I think I would totally reject any of those sorts of mainstream treatments because it just seems like they, it seems like they do so much more harm and it seems like they're, they're so, they're so uh, tortuous. So I'm wondering when you first received the diagnosis, did, did you consider just going untreated or just uh, pursuing kind of the the holistic, maybe what some people might characterize as the the woo woo type solutions out there. Well, your your question is there's many steps or many many layers yeah, to sure. the question. <laughs> I threw a lot at you. <laughs> yeah, no, and, and so let me try to let me try to answer them. Uh, first of all, I, I did I did listen to the podcast. I I read uh, parts of of the blog. Uh, I haven't read the books, but I've seen the information. And we're, we're definitely talking about your conversation. There were two smart people talking about something that is valid. Like it is a valid uh, conversation to have in any situation under, no matter what you do, even if you decide not to do treatment, you have to balance risk versus benefits versus, versus options. You have to do that. Like, you have to think about that from all angles. L let me just say that I know a lot of people who have died because of cancer and have had treatment, have had lots of treatment or a certain type of treatment. But I also know a lot of people who have been diagnosed with cancer, done nothing, and have died as well. Like, mm -hmm. I, I, mean, I mean, there are a lot. So, and, and again, this goes back to that all right, you're driving down the street and there's a burning building. I don't think you really know what you're going to do until you're put in that situation. You may think it, and that's okay if you do. I don't want to debate that. I will say this. When somebody looks at you and says, you have cancer and we don't have a cure. I mean, are you just going to sit there and say, okay, I'm going to take more vitamin D or say, okay, what about this? What about this? What about this? I think, uh, I, and this goes back to, there's a lot of people who try to talk to me about cancer and what they think they know about cancer who've never had cancer. And so let, let me tell you a lesson I learned early on. And this was a gift given to me. It was uh, early in my diagnosis. Uh, found the tumor in the leg. And after we had the, the tumor in the leg, 
I was told I was cancer free because remember it was misdiagnosed, right? So they were like, oh, you're good, you're good. So about six months later, I started blacking out and I started blacking out on a regular basis and passing out, I mean, blacking out. Like I would wake up in the middle of the night laying on the bathroom floor. That's and scary. One specific, and one specific day I blacked out and, and because of the blackout, I had hit my head. So I figured I should go, go to the emergency room and just get it checked out. So I'm, I'm in the emergency room and I, I'm thinking to myself, two, two things after he says, hey, we got good news and bad news. You know, good, the bad news is we found a new tumor. Good news is it, it's definitely not your cancer. I remember thinking to myself in that moment that, oh, no, that's not where I started. Here's, here's where I was going. I, I remember where I was at. So early on in my diagnosis, I got the greatest gift ever. Uh, I was in Scottsdale, and it was when that that cancer had moved uh, into into my what they called was the jawline, but actually ended up into my sinus cavity. I was sitting in a room with my oncologist, and there was a radiation oncologist in the room. There were three or four oncologists in the room, and and when they realized that it was a different type of cancer, my oncologist set this meeting up. And I remember uh, sitting in a room, in a, in a conference room with four or five people, six people. And I looked at my doctor and I said, doc, I said, um, I started asking questions. I'm like, well, is this and this and this. And he stopped the room and he said, JT, he said, in this of over a hundred years of experience with cancer, but you have cancer. So you're the expert here. And that was the greatest gift for me because what it did was it said, okay, at the end of the day, there's going to be a lot of people telling me a lot of things and their opinion. And let, let's make no bones about it. Most people are guessing. Even the most, even the most experienced oncologist guessing. But, but that's, what, that's what we have. So I say to myself, when it comes to these questions about doing treatment or not doing treatment, I don't think you can look at that, or at least I can't look at that as absolutes. There have been times where I said, all right, let's, let's take a break. Like, let's not do this type of treatment. Let's do this. I mean, the chemotherapy I had here at Mayo Clinic a couple of years ago, we did two rounds. And I called my doctor and said, look, uh, we got to stop this chemotherapy. And he said, I said, it's going to stop my heart. Like I can feel it. And sure enough, we, uh, we looked at the heart and the capacity was down like 20%. And we stopped the chemotherapy. We allowed it to heal. Uh, we allowed myself to heal. And that same chemotherapy that I had is the only chemotherapy available. So if we decide to use that chemotherapy at a later time to try to slow my disease down, we'll just back the, the medication off. But I have the understanding of it all. But you can't look at absolutes. Nobody out there that has a 100% understanding of any type of disease that can tell you for sure, if you do this, this will be the result. They're guessing. And, and I hate to use that word guessing because it sounds like they don't know what they're doing. They're just throwing things out. But they're trying to make the best educated decision for you based on what they know, what they see and what they're hoping for. And so I'm okay with that because I understand that. And at the end of the day, it's my call on what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. Tell me about, tell me about what, uh, what sorts of biohacks, supplements, things like that you got in your life that help you to maintain. I use, uh, um, it's interesting. I recently um, added a doctor to my team last September. And I encourage people to do that all the time, to add somebody to your team, not just to do it, but somebody with a different camera angle, camera view. Um, I, uh, we added a doctor who's uh, in charge of integrative health at Mayo Clinic. And he was the integrative health doctor at Duke Medical Center for many years. And so his job is to look at complex situations and say, well, what if we added this? Or what if we added that? 
And so I, uh, I added a couple of supplements re recently. Um, one is a liver supplement to help aid my liver. And, and the other is a supplement that is with overall healing, continual healing. At the same time, what are the names uh, we of had those? A What's that? What are the names of those? Uh, reverse a cell. Reverse a cell. Do you, can I grab them real quick? It'll take oh, one yeah, second. Yeah, yeah. All, right, All right. So I use uh, the first is uh, made by Thorn. It's called Reverse a Cell. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, it aids in, in, in helping with my liver, uh, with my body. I'm sorry, this is not the liver. But what this does, it's a dietary supplement. I take it, I take a couple of capsules a day. This is the MitoQ. And uh, this is- this Oh is yeah, MitoQ is great. It, yeah. it gives you kind of, it, it gives you kind of focused CoQ10 delivery to the mitochondria. Correct. And so, uh, and, but, but we also incorporated a couple other things. Um, every single day I use, and, and this was really just based on my research. I do uh, every single day, I, I use some edelberry, I, apple cider vinegar. Uh, I do flaxseed oil. I do, do that every single day. And then back in, uh, uh, starting in November, I started at the direct integrative uh, doctor. Uh, we started intermittent fasting, and the the reason for that wasn't to lose weight. The reason for that was, and and I remember the conversation. He said, "Look, um, we are far away from making a declaration that diet will affect will actually cure your cancer." But, uh, but we, we looked at it from a standpoint of two things. We realized that if we fasted, that my digestive system wouldn't have to work as hard, right? I have a lot of treatment. Like when I, I just had radiation two weeks ago, it was to a, a tumor on the outside of my spinal cord. And we rushed into treatment because if cancer jumps into the spinal cord, we've got paralysis issues. So See, so that's, you know, going back to, to the earlier part of your question, if, if you have somebody say to you, hey, look, we found a three or four centimeter tumor that's on the side of your spinal cord and has the ability to pop in the spinal cord in your future. And if it does, you will be paralyzed from the middle of your back through your legs. And they say, well, we've done radiation and radiation usually takes care of these tumors. What are you going to say? Are you going to say, okay, I'll take some supplements or no, I'm not going to do this. Or are you going to say, nah, I'll be paralyzed. Like what, what you'd have to make some hard decisions. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why I say, look, and, and again, I, I don't, I'm not knocking anybody who says, I don't want to do treatment. I tell this to people, even my own family members, because since I've been diagnosed, I've had a family member who was diagnosed with cancer. And, and I had to say to them, your disease is your disease. You have to choose what you want to do. I can't make these decisions for you. But to suggest to people blindly that um, if you get cancer, you shouldn't get treatment, I think is irresponsible. I also think it's irresponsible if somebody gets cancer, you should say, you should do this. So I think it, the approach has to be, what do you feel comfortable? And, and I'll, I, I agree. Listen, uh, there is difficulty in the treatment of cancer. I mean, I'm, my, I mean, I've had more radiation. I've hit the ceiling of radiation three or four times where they're like, you know, we can't go past this, but it works. So we have to. You, you've been to Chernobyl and back. Multiple times. Yeah. I mean, I, I've had, uh, you know, they, they, they reference them in rounds. I've had over, I, I'm somewhere between 140 and 150 treatments. Now, it's, what does that mean? Like, sometimes the fractions are lower in, in a radiation dose than they are higher. But what that means is over the course of the last six and a half years, I've sat in a machine and had some type of radiation 
thrown at a tumor. There are, there are side effects. There's no question. I, and I, I tell people that all the time. Um, I, I, you know, my hands and feet, my fingers are tingling right now. I, I don't, it's neuropathy, right? I mean, but again, if a doctor looks at you and says, there's a tumor and it's going to pop into your spinal cord in the next, it could be 60 days, it could be six months. But we know it's there. We have the opportunity to minimize it, to pull it away from the spinal cord. I mean, you know, okay, you're going to stand on a high ground and say, well, no treatment. And if you want to do that, that's okay. But I, I do think it's irresponsible for anybody to make wide statements like that. I think it's good to educate people on it, but I don't know. I, I feel like, I feel like everybody has to make those decisions for themselves. And I, you know, I'll, I'll tell you this, I'll be very honest with you. I didn't understand early on, you know, two, three years into my diagnosis, when people would quit treatment, they'd be like, I, I can't, I'm done. I never understood that. But I understand it now, because I've been through so much treatment, the idea of going through more treatment, if, if, if a doctor looked at me and said, hey, we can give you six months of this treatment to get you seven months of life. Uh, I might say, you know what? I'm, I'm just going to go enjoy. That's yeah, not much, of a, not much of a trade-off. Yeah, and, and listen, I mean, and then there, there's also, I mean, I've had to tell my parents three times that I wasn't going to make it to the end of the year because, because that's what I was told. And then something changed. And cancer's fast-moving. Things change positively and negatively all the time. I, mean, I had a doctor, I, I came back, I was uh, on a missions trip to Brazil a couple summers ago. And I came back and my oncologist called me and said, hey man, we, we found six, uh, six, I think it was nine, nine new sites, lesions or, wow. or disease. And I said to him, I remember it was like middle of September. And I said, well, can we, can we uh, do treatment after the holiday? holidays? He said, you're not gonna make it if we do that. So well, let's start treatment. And, and so I think, again, it's, it's, it's in the moment, in the situation, that's when you have to make the best decision possible. Mm -hmm. Okay. A few other things I wanted to ask you about. You, you, you said you were single. I, I, I'm wondering if you've done any dating while having cancer and what is that like? Yeah, it's difficult. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Um, I, I was dating a gal. Um, I was dating a girl early on in my diagnosis, and it was on and off again, and has been on and off again through part of, part of this uh, diagnosis. It's tough. And, and here's why it's tough is you know, we're in this, we're in this framework of social distancing right now. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the first things you learn as a cancer patient is social distancing. Yeah. I, imagine. Like, it, I mean, to be honest with you, I mean, I have dear friends right down the street and we get together on Sundays. We won't, of course, today. And there can be, there can be 20 adults and 30 kids. And I love every single one of them. But if there's community food, I can't touch it. I can't risk that because my immune system is diminished, right? So I've learned how to navigate life and, and just try to kind of make sure I put myself in the best position. From a dating standpoint and a relationship standpoint, it can be difficult because there's an emotional side with cancer too. And, and so sometimes uh, what you find, you find yourself uh, not being able to open up or you find yourself not being able to give on an emotional standpoint because you're spending so much of your emotional, uh, your, your emotional side in the fight of what you're dealing with. And you've got limited uh, resources. You have limited resources. And so you, again, uh, 10 good hours a day. That's it. Like when I wake up, when I wake up, uh, I get 10 hours. Now that's great because uh, six months ago it was eight hours. 
And so you got to choose how you're going to spend your time. And sometimes that becomes really difficult. Here's the other thing is there have been times where I just, I don't feel like pulling somebody into what I'm dealing with is going to be worth it. Mm-hmm. And, and I hate to use that. I hate to use that because they're worth it, but I don't have any energy to try to make them feel okay about what I'm going through. I don't need a nurse, right? I, that's not what I need. And so a lot of times relationships like that become, uh, you're dating somebody and they become your caretaker. And I talk to people about that all the time. I'm actually working on that podcast. Uh, that'll be the next one I work about is how do you choose your caretaker? Because just because that's your wife or just because that's your husband or just because that's your best friend doesn't mean they're going to be a good caretaker for you. And then there is also an emotional turmoil on on the caretaker. And so being a single guy, having a girlfriend, let's just call it a girlfriend, like, you know, where we're in a relationship. It's tough because there's part of me that I don't want to pull them into this. But at the same time, I also don't want to spend the energy making them feel about what I'm going through. And that, that, that can be really. Yeah. I can see how I, I, I can see how it would be. Yeah. You, you don't, you don't want to drag other, you don't want to drag other people through everything, through everything that you're, you're going through, but you know, it's another one that I got married a couple of years ago and I regard it as the best decision I ever made because I can just, I, especially now with what's going on in the world with the social distancing and the self quarantining that we're all subject to all of my, I have all these, you know, friend, I lived all over the world. So I've met, you know, a, it seems like a million, you know, cool young people. And a lot of them are are single and they're really pretty bummed by the self quarantining now but having a wife uh self quarantining is, is is not bad at all it's uh actually it's actually kind of fun so i can i i'm i i can see why you would be a bit bearish on on relationships at this point but i can also i can see how like being married would probably make it a whole lot easier to go through what you're going through. Yeah. I mean, listen, I'm, I'm not suggesting you get cancer and you go divorce your wife. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> I mean, if somebody's in your life and you've already done life together, then obviously you're going to continue. I, I wouldn't suggest that, you know, if somebody gets cancer, that automatically their wife should be their caretaker. I think their w- wife needs to be part of the care, but there's an emotional toil. I mean, on this, I, 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 Story I'm working on today about the financial side of cancer. I think it was like uh, 42% of marriages where somebody's diagnosed with cancer have have multiple relationship issues because it's it's very big. Mm-hmm. And so I, I think I think by nature, um, if I had to choose it, I if 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 there was a way to to have a relationship with what I'm going through where I didn't have to spend my emotional uh, energy on making somebody feel about something that I feel good about something I'm going through, I would probably chance on that. But at the same time, there's collateral. And to bring somebody into that who has their own life just because of that, I, I'm, I'm gun shy. I, I just have to be honest with it. And, and I've had an experience before where I, I was in a relationship with somebody during this and it just, it's, it's spun out of control and, and, and not, and, and this person was an angel, like they were there for me, but cancer, cancer is a physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual disease. It's all of those things. And, to be honest with you, sometimes the physical side is the easiest side to go through. It's the emotional and the mental and the spirit. It's those battles that are you struggle in. And when you bring somebody into that, it's hard to stay single-minded focused because you're trying to assure them or, you know, I, I say this to people often, 
Uh, I have a dear friend in here in uh, in the in the Jacksonville area. Is, is part of the reason why I moved here because uh, her and her family were here, and if I needed them, they they would be here for me. But you know, early on, she would get upset if if I wouldn't take her to the hospital with me for scan days, mm -hmm. and and I don't take anybody to the hospital because when I go to the hospital, when I walk in that door, I have a mental shift. Like what I do when I walk into that hospital. I don't, I don't spend time thinking about what I'm going through. I try to be there and be available for other people who are struggling because if I change my focus, I don't worry. There's no anxiety. If, if I was to pick my friend Allie up and we were to go in for scans, the dynamic would change the minute we got in the car because she's going with me to support me. And so all of a sudden, I think the anxiety would start and, and there's a mission. And to be very honest with you, I don't want to do that. Like, I, I, want, I want to be able to go in, do what I need to do, and get out. Like, I don't, you know, I, I have scans. I was looking at it yesterday. I have scans starting at 10 o'clock on, on Tuesday morning. You know when I'll walk into the cancer center? At 10 o'clock. I won't, I won't wake up and have a conversation about what's going on, how you feeling about this, you know, are you nervous, da, da, da. All of that creates anxiety. And so what I do is I'll get up. I'll drive to the hospital. I'll do my scan. If I have a break between my scan and my doctor, I leave the hospital. I'm not walking around the hospital thinking about, oh my gosh, did the results come? Da, 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 da. That's the emotional side. Now, that's how I work. Not everybody is the same. And I recognize that. You know, some people need to have that comfort, but I don't. And because of the reason why I don't, it's really, really hard to get into a relationship because. You know, it's obvious if you know me or because I'm open about my cancer. One of the first things we're going to talk about is I'm battling cancer and that can make people uneasy or it can make them want to become part of your care. And I don't need to spend my emotional time explaining. And, you know, I always say this to cancer. I always say this. I, I talk I talk to a lot of cancer patients, but I also talk to a lot of family members and they say, well, what should I say? Or what should I do? And, and I always say, look, just listen to the patient. Just watch them. They'll show you what they need. And I, I said this early on to my friend, one of my friends. Um, I said, look, and they were, they, were, they were in my front room. I was in a good place. And they started crying about my cancer. And I was like, stop. Like, just stop. Well, I'm sad. I'm upset. Yeah, I'm like, that's, that's a lot to do with. This isn't about you. Like, stop. And sometimes when you're in cancer and you're dealing with it, the people who come your way, they, because cancer's scary, and I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to downplay who they are or, or say bad, but their, their feelings and emotions are coming out based on how they feel. And I said, listen, when I'm happy about life, be happy with me. When I'm crying, cry with me. But right now I'm in a good place, so stop crying because I don't need that in my life. And so to, to have to walk somebody through and make them feel about good about something that I'm going through and I've got from a mental and emotional standpoint, I have to be honest with you. And this sounds really, really mean. And, but I said it early on, you have to learn to be selfish. It's too much work. And I'm fighting for survival. It, listen, if I, if I get to a point where I've survived this and I've moved away from being tied to a hospital or a medical plan, I would love to explore that. But right now, to have to juggle all of that, like cancer is enough to juggle. So I, I try to stay away from that. Yeah, got to keep your party straight. Well, finally, I wanted to ask you about the, the global pandemic and how that has impacted the treatment and the care that you need to get. Wow, it's it's funny you say that because we we think a lot alike. The things that you've talked about here today are all things that I've thought about and not just thought about, but I've released a podcast on because so my oncologist said to me, JT, if you get the virus, we have problems. He point blank said that to me. And and he knows me well enough to know that that's not going to panic me. And so uh you know, I, I was thinking about, about this and, 
And so I, I released uh, an, an episode on that, not to panic people, but I'm sure there's a lot of cancer patients who, you know, this is the last thing that they need to deal with. I mean, I still have to go to the hospital. But several of my appointments that were non-essential were canceled, of course, like acupuncture was canceled and, and uh, some of the other services that I re receive at the Mayo Clinic. But, you know, my scans, they're going up on on Tuesday. And I, I honestly thought, to be very honest, I thought they might even push my scans. But I, I had uh, a, a care coordinator call me last week and say, look, um, we just want to let you know that that we're, we still need to do the scans because, because this virus is here and we're dealing with it and we're taking precautions, but we can't get off track with what we're doing with you. And so for cancer patients, depending on where your disease is and what this is and what your treatment plan is, you you still need to stay up on on what it is you're doing. Take guidance from from your doctors. Uh, I I personally would scan if you've been actively in a treatment plan. I think cancer moves quickly. It's unpredictable, uncontrollable, and it can turn even negative or positive in a matter of weeks. Is so I I would say um, I would say it's is that you have to keep mindful and you have to be smart about. But uh, I tell this to people all the time. I, I've been battling something that uh, has been difficult on all fronts. Uh, a virus, you know, I obviously don't want to get and I'm, I've lost a friend who's already had the virus. I have two that are in the hospital because of this virus. And I think really? it's going to be a crazy couple of weeks here. Um, but at the same was, time, was it a I, friend? I, was it a friend that that also had cancer? No, 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 no. Uh, it's interesting. I, I have three friends. Uh, one who passed, sixty-one years old, was diagnosed with the virus a week ago Friday. Went into the hospital Friday night and passed away on Sunday morning. And wow, didn't have, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, I mean, really, like you know, a a quick case. I, I don't I don't know of a lot of health problems that they had prior, but 61. I have another friend who's sixties, has had a lot of health problems with a rehab center, got the virus and and was put into the hospital in oxygen a couple of days later. And it's been it's been four or five days since they were diagnosed with the, the, the virus and it's been up and down and they, they had a really, really rough day early on and then they started to bounce back. And then I have a third friend who was uh, diagnosed uh, with the virus, but not hospitalized. And I, I'll be very honest with you. Um, I think, I think we're all going to look at this in time and we're going to say we wish we would have done more uh, on a lot of fronts, you know, being safe and and in quarantine and and being prepared financially and being prepared mm -hmm. whatever. Not not to panic people. I think we'll look back at it, but it's easy to say that too. It's easy to say, you know, and follow the road after we've gone through something. Oh yeah, you know this this and this. It's always easy to play that, but I don't. Uh, I look at my my cancer for me. I look at that as something that I have to continue to continually be single-minded focused on. Like I can't just because uh, I, you know, I, I shouldn't go out or be around people that doesn't give me the opportunity to mentally or emotionally disconnect from them. Um, do I still have you? Yep. Yep. I'm okay, still here. You know, I mean, I stay in contact. I I uh, I have a group of friends that we meet, like I said, every Sunday. Uh, we get together and, and we do life together. We're just friends and we do a Bible study together and eat together. And and we can't do that this week, but we're all going to get on a Zoom call later tonight just to check in on one another. You know, I talk to my parents every single day. I, I've tried to up that emotional connection, not necessarily for myself, because I'm actually, I, I do that. Like I've had to do that, but I can see how it's affecting others. Uh, I worry for some cancer patients because it is so overwhelming, the emotional and, and the mental and the physical and the spiritual side of the disease 
Now all of a sudden you've shut some of the things off that they enjoy because, you know, if you're battling cancer, when I, before I was diagnosed with cancer, I used to, I used to hike huge mountains in Colorado, 14, 14 ers I used to do four. I, I can't do that anymore. So you're the things that you're able to do shrinks. And now all of a sudden, uh, other people are shrinking. So it has the ability to be more difficult, more isolating and depression and stuff like that. So I, I would warn cancer patients, number one, stay on track. Like, 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 you know, the things that you probably need to do at the hospital and you know, the things that you could probably pass on. Like I, I get acupuncture every other week because of the damage to my leg and the and fact the acupuncture that acupuncture makes a difference. Puncture is a game changer. Like I'll, I'll tell you this. Um, I got acupuncture because when they took the tumor out of my leg, it was in the calf muscle. So they ripped one of the calf, calf muscles out. And that sounds like pretty easy, but it's not. They cut through muscle and tendons and nerves. They pull out a, a muscle and then they repair your leg. And so you would think like, all right, okay. So you'll, you know, I've, Oh, I, I can't, I can't move. I can't move my ankle or my foot. Like I used to be able to my whole, uh, uh, my whole alignment is off. And so we decided to try acupuncture a couple of years ago to try to get the flexibility, try to get healing in the leg because the blood flow is down and the nerve damage is there. It's a game changer. It, it like, it's a game changer. It was a game changer. I remember when the physical therapist suggested it, I was like, Okay, sounds weird to me, but let's give it a shot. And it immediately made a difference. Now, like I said, I, I usually go every other week when I'm not in active treatment. When I'm in active treatment, I either go once a week or I, or I adjust it and I don't go at all. It depends on what type of treatment and how my body's feeling. But I love, I love acupuncture, but it's not worth it for me to go to the hospital and my health to to get acupuncture. Remember how I said it earlier, you, you have to weigh the risk versus the benefit versus the options available to you at the moment. And I think that's like a decision for a cancer patient. If it's, Hey, uh, I've been battling breast cancer for three years and, uh, and I, you know, I haven't had my yearly scan. So if I push this, it's going to be a year and a half. I wouldn't push the scan. I'd go get the scan. But if it's an appointment to go see somebody in the mental health department where you need to talk to them because you need to deal with things, there's other ways to do that. Get on the phone with them. Like, you know, I mean, so I think- <laughs> I'm pretty sure they can do that via Skype, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I have no problem saying this. Uh, you know, there are, there are two mental health uh, professionals in my medical team. One is a, a psychologist and one is somebody who deals with mind body. And I think I've seen a psychiatrist once or twice in three years, but I can pick up the phone at any time and call them and say, I need to come see you. My mind body health person, I've seen her twice and either one of them I can access on the phone, not worth going to the hospital for in this situation. So I just tell people to stay engaged with their care and do the things that are medically necessary if you have to do them. Like, like I said, Tuesday, I'll go in, I have scans, I have a blood test. And because I'm there, I'll have a meeting with my medical oncologist. On Thursday, my radiation oncologist, who's been doing most of my treatment the last couple of years, so he has a big voice in what we're doing. Um, we're going we're gonna to talk on Thursday because he's in surgery on Wednesday. And I'm not going back to the hospital to talk to him on Thursday. We have a call set. So that's how I tell people, but you got to stay engaged. Um, you got to stay engaged for what's going on, if there's a virus or not. But, you know, you have to alter things based on what's going on. Sure, sure. Yeah, it sounds like what you've been through has instilled uh, quite a degree of stoicism in you. So the virus... Not that big of a deal to you, but it's, it's, it's kind of an opportunity to reconnect with everyone else because there's everyone else in the world is, uh, is experiencing something unprecedented, 
almost everyone in the world has a bit more free time on their hands. So there's, yeah, there's a real silver lining in all of this to uh, reconnect via, you know, via Skype call, via Zoom, via telephone call with those people in our lives that we have perhaps let our relationships with them kind of just dwindle down into a, you know, a Facebook friend connection or whatever. Yeah, I, um, it, it's been interesting. My office is in the, is in the front part of my house. I'm actually in my studio now, but my office overlooks, uh, there's a pond and there's like a field, like a small field. And, oh, and wow, people look walk by my, my office all the time. And, um, What's interesting is over the last couple of weeks, I've seen people I've never seen before. I, I've watched, you know, families out, you know, with their dog or rollerblading. And it is, it's a pause on things and it's causing people to, to become closer. And I think it's almost, again, I, I think there's going to be a couple of rough weeks here. And I think we're all going to say, I wish I would have done more. And I wish everybody would have done more. And, and we're all probably going to have a connection to this virus. Like, we're, maybe not personally, but we might know somebody who knows somebody who's, who's been affected and, and, and may not, and, and may pass. And, and I think it's going, there's going to be some, some, some sadness and there's going to be a lot of healing, but I think there's also going to be a new sense of what is important. And even if that only lasts for a short time, it's still positive. And I don't want to downplay, I mean, uh, from, from what I've heard, this, this fears, if you get it. And I pray that, you know, I, I fear for my parents all the time. They're, you know, they're in their late 70s, early 80s. And, and I, I, try, I almost tried to put them in time out last week because they were going out. And I'm like, no, you need to yeah, stay you gotta home. you got to have a talk with them about that. Yeah. And, and I, I realized at the end of the conversation is they, they still look at me like I'm, I'm a kid. They're not listening to me. And, uh, but, you know, I'm not fearful. I've, I've never been a full person. I mean, the one thing we all have in common, every single one of us, is at some point, uh, the, the truth is, is we're not, none of us are getting out of here alive. <laughs> I mean, at some point, and that's life. And I don't, I want to enjoy every moment as long as I possibly can. And so I don't spend a lot of time uh, in anything being fearful. I'm not, I'm not fearful of, of, uh, of, of any of this. And so that doesn't mean I don't believe it's serious. I mean, I don't need to take precaution. People need to be smart, but I, I never try to control something I can't control. It just, why would I spend any mental energy on that? Mm. Well, I'm going to direct, especially people who might have cancer or maybe even someone who has a friend or loved one, which has cancer. I'm going to direct them all to go and check out your podcast, which is Cancer and Chill. Now, I'm curious, Cancer and Chill, does that come from like, like Netflix and chill? Yeah. So, yeah, you know, there's a double meaning to next Netflix and chill, of course. And so what <laughs> yeah, I yeah. wanted to do, right, when I, when I, I, when I looked at doing a, a podcast, a, there, there's a lot of podcasts where doctors are sitting in a room and they're talking about treatment protocol or they're dissecting research. And, and so I, I'm just, I'll just be very honest. I think they have their place and I think that's important, but being a cancer patient and, and talking to hundreds of cancer patients, the last thing they want to hear, or the last thing I want to hear is two doctors debating if a treatment is right or the research, I don't, that's not where you are emotionally, right? You get cancer, you think you're going to die, you're scared, you think you're going to die and you want to get it out. There, there's a lot of other cancer, uh, cancer podcasts, cancer patient talking about how they beat cancer. And it's, it's more of a rah, 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 rah. And those have its place too. But what I wanted to do was I wanted to have a podcast 
that answered the questions that I needed answered when I was battling it in the moment. Because the reason, the reason why I started to look for information was because it wasn't available. And so Cancer and Chill uh, is a podcast where I'm a, I'm a cancer patient and I walk through things like, you know, how do you, how do you deal with the enormity of a cancer diagnosis? Uh, how to, you know, tactical ways to, to minimize stress and anxiety. What happens when you become depressed and isolated? Um, how do you handle the financial side of cancer? How do you up your cancer IQ? How do you, I, I have a podcast that it's how to build your medical dream team. So, so the, the cancer and chill came to me from the Netflix and chill, because what I realized was it, it, I, I wanted, I wanted a name for a podcast that really kind of identified it as being different because, and it really is, it's okay. So you have cancer and cancer is really, really, it's not a fun experience, but you have it. Now, what I want you to do is let, let's all take a deep breath and let's think this through. Because what I don't want you to do is make decisions out of fear and anxiety or the idea that you might die or make no decisions at all. And so I wanted to be a gateway to people to say, okay, I have cancer and they say it's terminal, and I don't know how to tell my kids. Mm -hmm. And so the podcast is, all right, I've been in this experience, and this is what I did. This is what I learned. This is what I might do differently. And so really it was for people to, you know, to look at cancer and say, what is this? And then discover it. And then, you know, a lot of people have podcasts, and because it podcast is cool right now, everybody's got a podcast. And, and I think that's great. I've been to uh, podcast conventions, two or three of them. And I think oh, it's a really? great thing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I've, I've been to podcast movement uh, last year in, in Orlando. And I, I went to PodFest just a couple months ago here in Orlando. I was scheduled to go to Dallas uh, for podcast movement in August, but I'm sure it, it'll probably be moved or, or, you know, I don't know that for sure, but I would assume. But a lot of people have podcasts. But I want a podcast. The reason why I'm doing a podcast is, is because I want somebody to feel connected in a world where there isn't anxiety and there's actual actionable information that may help you. That was the goal. Like a lot of people, you know, a lot of people, there are a lot of people who have written books and people buy those books and then they sit on the shelf and nobody reads them, right? I wanted a podcast where somebody says, okay, this guy's battling cancer. I'm battling cancer. He's addressing fear and anxiety. I have a high level of fear and anxiety. Fear and anxiety. Is there one thing that I can take from this podcast that might help me? It's the whole goal. Like the only goal truly is to help somebody who has cancer in their path. And that's anybody from a, a current patient, a former patient, a caretaker, a loved one, I try to address it from that. But cancer and chill was just, you know, it was like, all right, that's really what I'm trying to say. Because I had, I had a bunch of names, like it was cancer patient to patient. It was this, it was that. And everything kind of pushed me into that. I'm, you know, debating things. I, I haven't had a guest on my podcast yet. You know why that is? Because I'm the expert. And, and that doesn't mean I'm the medical expert. That doesn't mean I know everything. But I'm telling people what I've experienced in order to try to help them. At some time, people will come in. But I wanted to push that, look, I'm like you. I'm battling cancer. And there are times where I've had stress and anxiety. And here's three things that I did. Or here's, I did a podcast on, 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 uh, on declaring your reasons uh, for battling cancer. Hearing, you know, to, you know, coming up with the reasons why you want to fight and using those in the moments when you don't feel like fighting. Because I don't care who you are. If you've battled cancer, uh, you know when you're talking to somebody who's battled it. You have a common language, a common feeling. And I just didn't feel like there was, there was enough information out there. Unfortunately, what happens a lot is 
somebody's dying of cancer, they go to Google and they start Googling stuff and it's not good what you see there. And it creates this fear and anxiety. So I just wanted people to feel like, all right, here's a guy who's got cancer. All right, let's take a deep breath and let's, we understand this is bad. I'm not trying to, I'm not, I don't tell people really nice quotes. Like I, no, cancer patient doesn't want to hear that either. They don't want to hear, Hey, you're the strongest person in the world. Or it, 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 those are nice things to say, but that's not what my podcast is. My podcast is you got it. We're going to deal with this. So let's figure this thing out. And I'll direct people over to your Facebook group also, because I imagine there's a lot of support there. How many members do you have in it? So in the, in the Cancer and Chill uh, Facebook group, I, I think I looked last night, it was like either 1,100 or, or 1,050. And, and that Facebook group is the same thing. Um, I, I don't, I mean, you go to a lot of Facebook groups on cancer and I, I appreciate everybody who supports them and administers them. They're great people. A lot of them are my friends, but somebody will post about some. And then all of a sudden, the inner doctor comes out in almost everybody, and they start saying things, and you can actually feel the stress building. And so in the Cancer and Chill Facebook- Yeah, that's what great for social media. That's what social media is great for, is, is building stress. Yeah, building stress and anxiety, and, and, you know, and everybody's a doctor. And, and so, so the Facebook group is really just for people to hang out support one another and help one another. I don't, I don't, I mean, if somebody goes off on a, Hey, do this or try this treatment or I, 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 I stop that right away. Because again, I said, as I said in the beginning, I'm not a doctor and I'm not your doctor. And so you can ask me, Hey, what do you know about this clinical trial? And if I know something, I'll say, well, look, I, you know, I know this, this, and this, or I know somebody who knows but Cancer and Chill Facebook group, you know, it's all different types of people from different angles. There's a lot of people in there who had cancer three, four years ago, and they're still dealing with the fear and the anxiety because they're worried that the next shoe is. And so I just try to make it be as positive as possible. There's tips in there. It's, um, you know, it's, it's a place for, for people to hang out and, 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 and just not feel bad about looking in and saying, okay, I got this disease too, and find a way to get through it. Yeah, sure. Maybe you'll be able to share this podcast in that group, and it'll be interesting. It'd be great to see what people's response is to it. Well, I guess finally, I'd just like to say, I, I really hope that you uh, stay in touch with me and let me know in the future when you beat this thing, because I think you have the right kind of attitude that you'll beat this thing. And there really is, a, you know, there's a lot of, boy, it seems like there's a lot of reasons to be pessimistic about the world, but there's also so many reasons to be optimistic about the world. And there's so many fantastic, exciting, promising new treatments that are coming out all the time to deal with cancer. And I'd love to, if you beat it one day, and I think you will, I'd, I'd love to hear about it. <laughs> yeah, man, I, um, I, I would love to keep in touch too. And, uh, and know that I'll obviously share this with as many people as I can. But as a result of this, if, if somebody comes into your path because and they need somebody on any level, please send them my way because that's really, you know, that's where I try to spend a lot of my time is how do I help somebody through this? And, and so I take that seriously. I feel like I never thought that at the age 45, my life would change from uh, a career of something I love to do to now all of a sudden I'm put into this situation and, and how am I going to be used to help somebody else? So absolutely. I would love that. I'd, I'd love to reconnect with you soon and give you updates and and, uh, and I'd love to uh, keep the communication going. Okay, great. Look forward to a continued conversation with you and everybody else. <laughs>